on This Week in Enterprise Tech. AT&T says, trust us, Verizon is forced to fix their poles, FLIR for everyone, and Ruckus tells you what to do now that your wireless network is faster than your wired. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 243, recorded June 9, 2017. Ruckus is all up in your business. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Cloudflare. More than 6 million websites, apps, APIs, and SaaS companies use Cloudflare services to weather whatever the internet throws at them. For a free online chat session with a Cloudflare support engineer, visit cloudflare.com slash twit. And by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobostore.com to learn more and use the code TWIT10 to save 10% off select Drobos. Welcome to Twyatt. This week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise, but I can't guide you by myself. It's an awfully complicated field. I'm going to need a little help from my friends. This one in particular, Mr. Brian Chi. He is the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii, although right now he is busy with uh, studying germ warfare. Was it, Gbert? Yeah, the plague. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I think you I, actually look worse than last week. Yeah, well, the good news is we finally found an antibiotic that seems to be killing this silly thing. And... Um, the joy, the joys of rattling and gurgling when you breathe. Right. H have you tried paying the Bitcoin ransom to get rid of this? Because I mean, I've heard that's actually. Very you know, effective. dude. If I could, I would. <laughs> well, it's just the two of us for the top of the show. But for those people who are big fans of wireless, specifically Ruckus Wireless, you're going to want to stay tapped because they've got some interesting information about the future of wireless. But Chibert, as we always do, let's kick it off with the blips. Now, last week, we heard just a little bit about the one login breach with a company which offers single sign-on and identity management for cloud-based applications being deliberately opaque about the details of the exfiltration. Now, this week, the public has a little more information, and it points to this breach being quite impactful. According to the company, a threat actor obtained a set of AWS keys that allowed them to access the AWS API and get access to a one login database within a US data center that contains sensitive user information. The data was encrypted by one login's proprietary encryption tech, but amazingly, the threat actor was also able to either get information or a tool that allowed them to decrypt the database. No word yet on how they obtained the decryption ability, whether it was stored in the same AWS storage basket or if it was obtained separately, but the impact is quite severe. One login serves more than 2,000 enterprise customers in 44 countries and counts Dell, Pandora, Microsoft, Cisco, Google, LinkedIn, Zendesk, Pinterest, Condé Nast, and Herman Miller among its largest customers. To deal with the breach, One Login is forcing new certs and keys for all apps and sites, recycling secrets in One Login secure notes, and prompting a password reset for all users. What this essentially means for all One Login users and customers is that they need to start from scratch. That's a pretty big blow to persistent authentication across platforms. Well, Amazon and Reddit are asking you to join them for a day of action to save net neutrality. Quote, the FCC wants to destroy net neutrality and give big cable companies control over what we see and do online. Unquote, activist groups fight for the future, free press and demand progress said in an announcement today. If they get their way, they'll allow widespread throttling, blocking, censorship, and extra fees. On July 12th, the Internet will come together to stop them. 
The activists and websites are still developing specific plans, but the basic idea is that major websites, startups, blogs, and forums will display a prominent message and provide their visitors with tools to easily contact Congress and the FCC to oppose the plan to gut net neutrality protections. A demand progress spokesperson told Ars Technica, Internet users will also be encouraged to upload and share videos about why net neutrality and internet freedom are important to them. So companies are asking for your help, are basically asking you to post some boilerplate on your website, blog, or etc. to blanket the internet with a way to spam the FCC in opposition to their vote on killing net neutrality. Now, the battle of the ISPs is spilling into the courts, or more precisely, is not spilling into the courts. A group of five Democratic senators have ousted AT&T as an abuser of forced arbitra arbitration to defraud customers. The issue stems from a CBS investigation that found more than 4,000 complaints in the past two years against AT&T and its subsidiaries in which deals and promotions resulted in overcharging that could not be remedied because of AT&T's forced arbitration clause. Specifically, AT&T's contracts include a class action waiver and language that strips consumers of the right to band together with other consumers to challenge a provider's widespread wrongdoings. The TLDR is if you've ever received an AT&T or DirecTV bill that seems to be slightly more each month than the previous and the previous and the previous, that is enabled because they know you can't force them to stop. The best you can do is to ask for an arbitration which will be decided by a group paid by the company against whom you are seeking arbitration. In commenting on the kerfuffle, AT&T suggested that, quote, arbitration is better for customers, man, unquote. The world is changing. With the UK doing their first arrest from a facial recognition van in South Wales. Well, it had to happen someday, what with facial recognition becoming ubiquitous in most international airports. The South Wales police told Ars Technica only that a man was recently arrested using facial recognition systems. This is a result of a new van parked at strategic locations in and around the city center in preparation for the UEFA Champions League finals. The article went on to say that there was an, apparently a warranty for this person's uh, – oh, not a warranty – a warrant for the person's arrest. But the police weren't going to provide any more details because of an ongoing investigation. South Wales police have previously said that they are serious about deploying automatic facial recognition on a wide scale. Quote, the world we live in is changing, and with that comes a need to change the way we police. We are investing in ensuring our officers have the tools and technology needed to most effectively protect our communities. As technology evolves into the future, so will the way our police operate, said the Assistant Chief Constable Richard Lewis. What with recent terror attacks, the escalation seems to be expected in the most surveilled city on Earth. Now, Microsoft and Qualcomm have been working on a full-speed project to give ARM-based Snapdragon 835 processors the ability to run x86 emulation, allowing a new generation of devices that run Windows 10 everywhere. Now, the use of a mobile chipset means always connected devices that sip rather than guzzle power, enabling the Windows 10 desktop to expand beyond Intel-based machines. That's an interesting concept, but not so fast. Intel has something to say about that partnership. Intel took the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the first x86 processor, the legendary 8086, to remind the world that they are ready and willing to protect their x86 innovations. In a statement that is textbook passive aggression, Intel's Stephen Rogers and Richard Ulick wrote, quote, In the early days of our microprocessor business, Intel needed to enforce its patent rights against various companies, including United Microelectronics Corporation, Advanced Micro Devices, Cyrix Corporation, Chips and Technologies, Via Technologies, and most recently, Transmeta. Enforcement actions have been unnecessary in recent years because other companies have respected Intel's intellectual property rights. Unquote. The celebration was supposed to be waxing nostalgic about Intel's contribution to the microprocessor, but to this man, it sounded more like... <clears throat> It would be a shame if some legal misfortune were to befall your fancy new processor. Unquote. Let the games begin. 
Sorry, yes, robots are taking jobs away, but maybe it isn't such a bad thing after all. Oklahoma City just got a new Walmart blockhouse where pre-ordered grocery items are picked up at the drive-up kiosk where customers can pick up bins of goods ordered online just by entering a unique pickup code they got at the completion of their online order. This experiment for now is only in Oklahoma City, but this seems like a logical extension of traditional online grocery shopping services like those from Safeway, like Safeway's home delivery service. So drive through pickup or home delivery, which is going to win in this new shopping option. Now, not too long ago, we got a glimpse into Intel's active management technology. It's part of their management engine, an independent processor embedded within Intel vPro processors and chipsets. Designed to be part of a lights-out management solution that would allow administrators to access all machines on their networks, even if they were off, it was also a potential gaping security hole that bypassed all security precautions baked into the operating system. Since then, we've been on the lookout for serious abusers of AMT, and yesterday, the engineers and Microsoft security team found one. The Microsoft security researchers discovered malware created by a group dubbed Platinum that uses the serial over LAN interface within the AMT to send and receive data over TCP. A simple script allows malware to be transferred to any computer with AMT provision, even if the network adapter is disabled. Once infected, attackers can exfiltrate data using the SOL channel in such a way that is most likely undetectable by current security tools. In response, Microsoft gave Windows Defender the ability to differentiate between legitimate AMT usage and stack activity that treats the SOL as a communications channel rather than a management channel. Furthermore, the Microsoft team made it clear that this isn't a flaw in AMT per se, but rather an avenue for exploit within a network that is already compromised. That does it for the blips. Next up, we're getting into the bites, and we've got a couple of fun ones. But for, before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, this episode is brought to you by Cloudflare. Cloudflare is on a mission to help build a better internet. Cloudflare makes your site or app faster, safer, and more reliable, so you can stop worrying about slow loading pages, downtime, or getting hacked. Now, Cloudflare is incredibly easy to use, and sign-up takes less than five minutes. Their global network of 115-plus data center caches your content and moves it closer to visitors. Their web optimization feature speeds up your code and makes it more mobile responsive. And to end, Cloudflare speeds up every request to your site with performant DNS, caching, content optimization, load balancing, and more. Oh, Cloudflare will also make your site, app, or API more secure. They don't just provide DDoS protection but their web application firewall is powered by a massive IP reputation score that updates for all users. Their 24-7 security team is constantly watching for new vulnerabilities and deploying real-time protection. Cloudflare also helps you to avoid cloud provider lock-in. No matter what you choose for your cloud compute, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or a combination of public hybrid cloud deployment, Cloudflare will work with all of them. And using Cloudflare gives your business the option to use more than one cloud provider so you don't get locked into any of them. It just makes sense. They also have flat pricing for everyone. If you're hit with a DDoS attack or if your site suddenly experiences a high surge in legitimate traffic, you still pay the same amount. Try that with your ISP. The plans range from free to $20 a month, $200 a month, and custom plans for enterprises with special needs. And right now, Cloudflare is offering Twit listeners a free online chat session with one of their top support engineers to answer any of your questions. Just visit cloudflare.com slash twit. That's cloudflare.com slash twit to sign up today. Again, that's cloudflare.com slash twit. And we thank Cloudflare for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's go ahead and move into the bites. This one is, uh, well, I, th I think it's interesting. This is not one of these blaming stories. It's just one of these stories that for any IT person out there, either uh, an administrator or one of the people in the, uh, in the trenches, should be interested in. And that's the fact that Verizon is being forced to fix a bunch of their poll problems. Now, we have been following this poll attach issue since we started talking about Google Fiber. This is the idea that there should be a simple process for a new competitor to come into a market and attach their fiber, their lines to utility poles across a city. Right now, it's in chaos. What typically works out is 
you have to negotiate each and every single poll and not just each and every single poll. You have to negotiate with every entity that is on each and every single poll. So if you come into a city that has, say, Verizon and Comcast and AT&T, you have to negotiate with Verizon and Comcast and AT&T for every single poll. That's just untenable. It costs so much money that it makes it almost impossible for a new competitor to enter the market. Well, the old FCC before this particular administration was trying to fix that. They were trying to make a one-touch policy. In other words, once you get the agreement from all parties to touch the polls, you have full ability to go up and attach your lines without having to renegotiate every single step of the way. Well, things are finally reaching the point where some of the incumbents are being forced to work to solve the problem. The Communications Workers of America and Verizon have reached a settlement to finally take down upwards of 15,000 double pulls. That's, this is what we're seeing in this picture like this. The settlement is currently only for various areas in Pennsylvania and one, is one of the larger roadblocks in this one-touch policy as they move from copper to fiber optics as it is promised in the uh, new plan for network modernization. Now, it should be pointed out that this case is enforceable by the Public Utilities Commission and was sought, brought by the Communications Worker of America to force Verizon of Pennsylvania to do the right thing. And in getting rid of all these double poles and getting rid of all these, these instances in which it becomes very strange to negotiate because you're not exactly sure which pole you are negotiating for, it is hoped that the Communications Workers of America will make it more tenable for a new provider to come in and play and compete. Chebert, this is one of these things where, as I mentioned at the beginning, you don't really think about. When we think about law and, uh, and communications policy in more general terms, this is looking at one very specific, very not well-known problem and trying to solve it. And that is, we, if, you're, if you're negotiating for polls, you should know which poll you're trying to put it on. Well, it actually goes beyond that. This is a case of Verizon dragging their feet. It's kind of like, Okay, we'll let you attach, but we got to fix the pole first. And then they don't fix the pole. Right. And when you saw those pictures, I mean, there's pole, a section of a pole that apparently the pole has had to be cut off because of a traffic accident or wood rot or something. And the communication workers of America, meaning the union, is saying, hey, this is stupid. You know, it needs to be fixed. But Verizon has been dragging their feet and dragging their feet and dragging their feet, and they haven't fixed it. Well, now the Public Utilities Commission is saying, hey, this, that's, that's it. You guys are – this is stupid. You got to do it. Fix the bloody polls. And the communication workers of America are saying about time. The unions want to do this. They've wanted to do this. They've gone as far as bringing a suit against Verizon. So this is going to remove one of the foot-dragging tactics that Verizon has been using to prevent competition in the Pennsylvania area. Now, for the consumer, what this, mean, what this has meant is that this is the reason why your DSL lines are so bad. This is why you haven't had expansion of your cable modems. This is why a lot of things haven't happened in rural Pennsylvania. Now that this is going to get fixed, the big thing that's going to happen is fiber optic rollouts. And this is probably also tied in to those Fios lawsuits that are happening about not delivering services as promised. So this is a really good thing. Um, I'm not going to give this to the current FCC because this is not the FCC doing this. This is the PUC. Um, but this is definitely a large, large step in the right direction for Verizon to clean up their act. Uh, when I was starting to read up on this, it was actually kind of shocking because, uh, I, like you, I thought, oh, okay, this is just a maintenance issue. This is just something that okay, they haven't got around to it. They haven't dedicated the resources to it. But over the years, it seems as if they like this. They like having an extra step that they can add and pull out whenever they need to block a competitor for coming into an area because they can say, oh, no, 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 yeah, the, the one-touch policy, we're, we're going along with that. But 
oh, oh, there's all this area where we're not exactly sure what kind of repairs we need to make to the utility poles. We've got two of them. It could take a while. Essentially, what the POC, PUC is doing is they're forcing the incumbent's hand to say, if you claim the rights to this piece of public property, you must maintain that piece of public property. How... How, how does this play out? I mean, obviously, this is not going to happen overnight where Verizon and all the other incumbents decide that they're going to invest major amounts of money into their existing infrastructure in order to get rid of this problem. But is this something that we'll see results from in the next two years, four years, five years, 10 years? Well, I'll tell you, from a technology and a labor standpoint, 15,000 double poles isn't that many? You know, look at it this way. The island of Kauai, after Hurricane Iniki, lost upwards of, I think, 70-something thousand poles uh, to the point where we actually ran out of poles in all the base yards of all the power companies and communication companies in the state of Hawaii. The vast majority of those poles were replaced within six months. Oh, that's interesting. So it's doable. But wait, but what, was the, what was the stick? Was it just a fine that they were holding over their heads? Uh, I, I'm i not sure. I've been reading a little bit more. Let's put it this way. The Public Utilities Commission has the power to remove Verizon from the market if they don't maintain, you know, if they don't comply. So that's one heck of a big stick. Um, will they do it? I don't know. You know, that's kind of the nuclear option. But the PUC, in many ways, has more power than the FCC when it comes to operations in municipalities. Okay, and uh, wait, expand on that. So the PUC, I get it, because the PUC does have more direct control over what's actually happening in the mun municipalities than the FCC, which is more of an oversight committee. But what can the PUC do that the FCC can't? Uh, the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, is what licenses you for operation in an area. So let, let, it's it's a little hard to explain, but let let's do an example. The I was sitting on a um, a board. It's called the Coalition for Competitive Telecommunications. We actually testified to the PUC, not to the FCC, and through lobbying efforts was able to break the monopoly of Hawaiian telephone for intra-lata communications, meaning inter-island. In those days, it was actually more expensive to call inter-island than it was to call the mainland United States. The, F the FCC didn't have anything to do with it. It was all the PUC. The PUC actually forced Hawaiian Telephone to remove the barriers to operation so that other people could compete in that market. So that is quite a bit of power, if you ask me. Indeed. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Let's, uh, I, I do want to get to the guest, but you have, you have an interesting case here because it involves our love for social media and what happens after we pass specifically what what happens to our personal information what happens to our data what happens to the the information that we have freely given to corporations once the user the person whose name is on record is no more Chiebert, tell me about what happened when uh, uh the parents of a uh, of a deceased tried to get control of her social media well in this case uh, a german appeals court rejected the plea um, on what, you know, when a set of parents tried to get access to their 15 year old daughter's Facebook account, um, the social networking site, in this case, Facebook fought the parents claiming that opening the account would breach the privacy of the girl's contacts, not necessarily of the girl. So this is where they're arguing that, yes, we agree. It's your daughter. She is a minor. Um, you are responsible for, but you're breaching the privacy of the people in her contact list. And that's why they're fighting this. Well, 
the deal here is the parents want access to the account to help determine whether the girl who was struck by a subway train in Berlin had committed suicide or not. And the family wants to review her chat messages and other account information in a bid to see if she was bullied, according to the BBC report. The lower court in Berlin had sided with the parents, ruling that the information can be inherited regardless of their content. But Facebook appealed the decision, and the appellate court ruled that Facebook had entered into a contract with the girl, not the family, and that the contact's contract cannot be inherited. Okay, so we're talking about a social contract. You've made a contract with the provider of your your social media provider of choice, and therefore that's not transferable? Apparently. And what's weird is they're saying it's not transferable even though the person the contract with was a minor, which under no circumstances means that the contract's actually with the guardians. And that's, what, that's why I'm having trouble with this court case and why I thought I'd bring it up. There's a very slippery slope here that the appellate court is basically saying that even though you're a minor, you can s execute a contract outside the authority of your parents or guardians. I think this is something uh, yeah. that's going to be a problem. That's absolutely a problem because you, uh, as we see, as we saw last week with the EULA shrink wrap case, you can't just take away constitutionally granted rights because you put an agreement, a uh, annotation that they may or may not have read. You absolutely cannot take away the protections granted to a minor just because a minor is using your social media service. I, I don't I don't see how this would survive any sort of court challenge. Is is this going to be challenged in court? Is this going to court? Well, we shall see. Um, according to Reuters, um, the appeals court is saying the online privacy is greater than the right of inheritance. That's the key here. So I got to imagine this is going to go um, to a higher court. Now, in the meantime, I think Facebook is trying to do a really fast uh, two-step here. And they're saying it would try to resolve the matter in a way that, quote, helps the family and at the same time protects the privacy of the third parties. Translated, we're going to try and give you what you want, but we're not going to try and create a precedence that can be, you know, cause all kinds of problems. They don't want a Pandora's box opened up. Um my question is, you know, what's going to happen when we start having cases of when it's a spouse? You know, there, there's right. nothing worse than losing your child. You know, we are, we're all in agreement on that. But Facebook is desperately, desperately trying not to have a precedent that's going to open up a giant can of worms. Um this is not something that's going to go away, and I'm really interested. I'm I'm thinking I should send this link to Denise, and have those have the tool guys go and do a deep dive on it. Yeah, and it's it's interesting here because I, I think you you've brought it up right. They they already have tried to fight several cases in which spouses tried to get access to a Facebook page that that might help in a divorce case, and they definitely don't want to get involved in that because that gets messy and that destroys customer trust. What's interesting about this, and many people in the chat room are pointing this, this issue out, is the fact that we're dealing with a minor. And while a minor does not lose all of their rights to privacy just because they are a minor, it's also been pointed out that it is illegal. You cannot enter into a contract with a minor without the permission of their guardian, their legal guardian, which is typically their parents. So if Facebook is trying to stand and say, well, we've got a contract with the deceased that cannot be broken – that doesn't hold water if the deceased is a minor. If if they did not speak with the guardian first, did not get permission from the guardian to grant this contract, then that contract is null and void. That's, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know, but this oh. sounds really, really shaky. I don't think they've got a leg to well, stand on here. I do have a question for you, though, and, and forgive me if you can't answer, but you've actually served on some hotlines in the past. What kind of guidance has the hotline people given you? 
Uh, well, I mean, it's it's actually pretty clear for us. Uh, first of all, the, the way that I do a hotline, it's not like I go to a building in San Francisco and I sit there and wait for calls. It's all VoIP. So we have a, a VoIP client that's set up and we get no information. We don't know who's calling. We don't know the number that they're calling. All that we get is typically a name, not a full name, but a name. So I, I know what to call them. And maybe the notes of the person who, who took the initial call. Uh, beyond that, the whole idea is if you don't know anything, you can't say anything. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work for social media. In social media, there's a lot more information there. And some of that information can be used for very nefarious purposes. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm no stranger to dealing with confidential information. But for me, it's, it's more clear cut than a Facebook. Yeah, sad. Why don't we go on to something more fun? Yeah, I you know, think so. Like looking, be, looking behind the curtain thermally. Let's do that. Now, uh, this past Tuesday, FLIR released their new FLIR 1 and their FLIR 1 Pro. In fact, I managed to get an advanced copy of it. It's a little module that can attach to your iOS or your uh, Android phone. This one particular one is for Android. It's, it's a USB-C connector. Uh, and I had a sit down with some of the, uh, the FLIR folk to find out what makes this different and where you might use it in your enterprise workroom. So if you're thinking about adding some vision to your enterprise kit, maybe you want to take a listen to FLIR. Network engineers will tell you that it's almost as important what tools they have in their bag as the knowledge that they keep in their heads, which is why we're speaking with Rebecca Potter from FLIR, who has a device that I think IT folk are going to find indispensable. Rebecca, thank you very much for coming to talk to the Twite Riot. Thanks for having us. Now, FLIR, of course, if we hear FLIR, the very name tells us that it's, it's going to deal with infrared. It's forward-looking infrared. It was technology that was really pioneered by, by FLIR, by, uh, I'd say, military applications, but has found its way down into consumer and enterprise use, specifically with the advent of Lepton. Tell me about this, this little teeny tiny chip that I'm seeing in front of me. Well, the Lepton camera is the camera FLIR developed a few years ago, and our goal was to miniaturize the technology much like the CMOS industry has miniaturized visible cameras for the smartphone industry. Um, so we did that, and uh, we've had pretty good success with it, and we've integrated it into a new product that we're here to talk about. All right. Now, when you say miniaturize this type of technology, what you mean is this is not a CMOS process. This is not a CCD process. This is a custom piece of silicon, something that only FLIR has. That's correct. Yeah, we have a, a specialized detector that we package um, with our technology. And um, we do a similar process to how you build a CMOS camera, but it is a separate sensor and a separate set of materials. Okay. And now FLIR, I, I have used your products in the past. In fact, I have a FLIR 1 that, that's fantastic. And it's, it's an interesting set of images and videos that I can pull up. But what makes it so difficult to do good IR? I have seen inexpensive products out there that say they do IR, but basically what they've done is they've taken a CCD or an existing CMOS element and they've removed the little filter, the IR right. cut filter that normally keeps IR from, from hitting the sensor. What is FLIR doing that those cheap products aren't? Well, what those products are doing is looking at near infrared which is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's right next to visible light in the, um, in the wavelengths that it looks at. But our camera sees longer wavelengths, um, 7 to 14 micron wavelengths, which are closer to microwaves and you can't see with um, a visible camera or with your eye. Yeah. And, and that's the, the difference between near IR and emitted IR. So when I have, say, an IR flashlight, that could be reflected IR. I Correct. can illuminate an object with IR that's not coming from the object, which is interesting and sometimes it's useful, but... Most of the time, what I want is I want to see how hot an object okay. actually is. What is the actual IR being emitted from the object? Near IR can't do that. Correct, correct. And so our new product takes this lepton sensor and uh, integrates it into this package that attaches to your phone. Um, we have both an Android and an iOS version. And uh, as you can see, one of our features is a different uh, combination of um, meters that can read that surface temperature. So I can read the surface temperature of the table or uh, maybe the monitor here that you see uh, back in the back of the room. Oh, fantastic. It's a little bit warmer. Now, okay, so there's, there's a lot of data coming to us on this. So first of all, I'm getting a, a temperature readout. And because this is detecting emitted IR and not reflected IR, that is a, it's a much better 
well, sensor for determining how, how much heat is coming exactly. off an object. Exactly. So for users that want to take a look at uh, items that might be getting hot, electronics, that kind of thing, um, this provides them a new tool to do that. Oh, FLIR has done something else with this because, I mean, actually, Jammer B, if you go back to that image, we noticed that, um, well, I can see the text on the screen. I shouldn't be able to see that. I, it should just be a pure blob of heat because IR is not going to differentiate between a, a black pixel and a white pixel. What's going on here? That's right. So what we've done is combine two sensors. And I can do, turn that off and show you just what the yep, thermal there camera That's is what showing. I'm used to seeing. That's right. But what FLIR has patented is the blending of a visible image with a thermal image. And that's really useful when you're looking at something that also has written information, like labels um, or text. And that comes through in our images with MSX. Oh, I, and that's, that's a very interesting process. And actually, that greatly increases the utility of right. this unit because now it's not just heat blobs. I, I, can, I can associate those heat blobs with actual parts and pieces and devices in, say, my data center. That's right. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the data center because, of course, this week at Enterprise Tech is an enterprise show. This, this is sort of a, a way to get IR, good IR technology, into the hands of consumers. But... Right. I see this as an enterprise tool. Tell me a little bit about using something like this in a data center. What, what would having this in my tool bag give me the ability to do if I'm, say, an IT manager? Well, we have a lot of products that are higher end and can be purchased maybe single units for right. a, a whole data center. But what this allows is that because the price point is lower, multiple technicians can have this technology in their hands and everyone has their smartphone. So it allows more use of the technology, which is really great for diagnostics, for finding things that are running hot when they shouldn't be. Um, and, and we see that as a really powerful use case. Instead of one technician having them, everybody in the team has one. Right. And, and you know, the obvious use case would be to see where the heat is coming from right. different equipment racks. If you've got an entire room, of course, a, a higher end product would probably make that a little easier to do. But Again, as you mentioned, this, this price point allows me to put it into the hands of more right. people, which increases the possibility that I'll find an issue before it becomes a problem. Right. It's a great diagnostic tool. Uh, uh, there, there was one use case that I, uh, I had heard of a while back. There was a technician who was playing around with the original FLIR one, not the Pro. And uh, he was looking in his data center just, just to show off, oh, look, there's heat blooms here, here, and here. And then he went up. And there were a bunch of power cables for their three-phase power. And he noticed that one was running considerably hotter than the others. Uh, and he was able to diagnose what would have become a catastrophic power failure just because he had a sensitive enough sensor. It, it didn't look like an IR blob. It looked like two cool wires and one that was running incredibly hot. That's the sort of uh, well, utility that I don't think people can, can think of ahead of time. But once they have this product, that becomes commonplace. Yeah, I think it's very useful, especially for monitoring equipment over time, because if something right. starts to change temperature, you can detect that and you can compare images over time. Um, I think that's got a great use case for maintenance that way. And of course, once you've got one of these for the, the data closet, you could always use it at home just to figure out could. where your heat is leaking out of it your house. Yeah. Yep. Rebecca, thank you so very much. Now, of course, we got to talk a little bit about price points because sure. we don't want to shock the audience. I have seen high-end IR units that can go for tens of thousands of dollars. If someone wanted to get one of these modules to attach to their iPhone, to their Android device, how much is it going to set them back? Well, the Pro is coming out at a price point of $399, and we have a consumer model as well. It's a little bit lower um, in performance, and it's at $199. So it really makes it an achievable purchase for most consumers. Rebecca Potter from FLIR. If they wanted to find out more about the FLIR 1, the FLIR 1 Pro, or what FLIR could do for them, where should they go? Um, all the information is on FLIR.com. Thank you very much. And that's FLIR. Now you can see clearly. You know, Chibert, I love our chat room because uh, they're in there talking about different uses for this. And one of them saying they could find infestations of, say, termites. And yes, actually, the, the sensor is that sensitive. Uh, we, we've been playing around with it here in the studio. And you can see the temperature variations in things like pipes and walls with pipes or walls that have leaks that are allowing hot air to get to the outside world. This is, uh, um, you know, I've played with infrared technology before, but as I said in the video, all of the IR technology I've played with has been sort of the cheap, remove the cut filter type technology where what I'm really seeing 
is reflected IR. To see emitted IR and only emitted IR, it's a treat. Oh, yeah. And science has been using this for a very, very long time. You know, you use real thermal imaging for geology, oceanography, you name it. Just about every one of the major sciences uses um, a thermal imaging system. Heck, one of the things that we're going to be installing on our ship is a thermal imaging system on the fantail so that even during storms, we can actually take a look at the instrument packages sitting there waiting to be deployed, and we can actually take its temperature without having to go out into the storm. Right. Uh, one of the other cool things I like about this, if you go to my product cam, this little knob here, that actually raises and lowers the connector, both USB-C and the, uh, the uh, lightning connector, because what they figured out was it's very, very inconvenient if you have to take your phone out of the case in order to use it. So they've made the connector adjustable. I, I love that. I mean, that. That alone makes it uh, good enough to upgrade. Now, this is the real-time imagery that I'm getting from my FLIR camera right now. And again, one of the things that they do here that other products don't do is they allow you to do a composite image. So this is what the regular sensor looks like. This is what the infrared sensor looks like, which is just a blob. And then I can composite the two. So now I get the infrared sensor, but I'm also getting details. I can actually see text and uh, icons on the screen that I, I would normally not. Uh, the, the other cool thing about this is uh, there are several different modes that allow me to identify individual pieces of information that I might want. So, for example, I could look for temperature ranges and spot. And this is super, super accurate so that I can actually see what temperature uh, are individual uh, pieces of, uh, of, of imagery that I, I have on my screen. Uh, you know, this, this is a great, great tool. I won't be using it all the time. But it is one of these things that it's now become part of my uh, my assessment. Anytime I go into a, a new workspace, into a new workplace, um, I'm looking for IR abnormalities because that's normally an indicator of something that would be of interest. I actually go and use it to look at their battery packs as they're charging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'll, tell, it'll tell you which cells are um, not charging correctly. And, well, one of the other things that we did, uh, we're going to be showing off on screensavers tomorrow um, there's a there's a cute little hack that you can do with this where if you take a thermal image of a pin pad after someone has typed in their uh, their their pin, you can actually see which keys they hit. And if you look at the decay heat, you just you use the spot meter to figure out which ones are hottest. You can figure out the order of the keys that they hit. Uh, kind of, you know, stupid. And I would definitely notice if someone was standing over my shoulder with a thermal imager, but still very, very cool tech. What do you think, Jibert? Want. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. It's good to know what you want. Well, folks, what we want is we want a great discussion with a guest, and that's what we've got uh, next. We've got Dave, and I'm going to mess up his name. I'm sorry, Dave. Britha? Dave Britha, who is the director of the product line management over at Ruckus Wireless. He's coming on to, to talk a little tech about the future of wireless. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, this episode is brought to you by Drobo. It's for all your storage needs. Drobo is the simplest, safest, most expandable solution that you can choose for your home or your workspace. They offer a complete line of external storage arrays, which you can buy preloaded with drives, or you could add your own. Now, where does Drobo fit into the enterprise? You might be asking yourself that, because Drobo has typically been associated with the home or the SMB. Well, they give you tier two storage, backup bulk storage, or entry-level virtualization. They've got work groups that produce images, videos, or media, and of course, bulk online storage, all that works well inside the Drobo universe. The Drobo 1200i is a 12-drive rack-mountable iSCSI storage array. It has three gigabit Ethernet ports, and this array is a cost-effective way to build a near-line archive to keep important data online. It can also be configured as storage in entry-level virtual server environments. The Drobo B810N is an 8-drive rack-mountable file-serving appliance. It has two gigabit Ethernet ports that support port bonding in case you need a little extra throughput. Now, this array is an ideal backup target for work groups under 100 people. So, of course, we're getting a little bit larger. And for your home or small office, Drobo recently introduced the Drobo 5 and 2, which is the next era of simplified networking-attached storage. 
The Durbo 5 and 2 provides high performance with an upgradable processor and port bonding capability via two gigabit Ethernet ports. It also features SSD compatibility, an MSAT accelerator bay, secure backup, remote data access and sharing, plus disaster recovery. There's also a great selection of Drobo apps that include everything from developer tools to media streaming. Folks, we've had Drobo here at Twit since the early days. Leo got one for the cottage. Remember the cottage? That was two studios ago, and it has stuck with him. What I love about Drobo is the fact that they tailor the tool for the mission. They want to give you the right storage for the right purpose. It's not one size fits all. Drobo lets you customize your storage life according to your needs. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to visit drobostore.com to learn more and to check out their complete line of products. Drobo has recently lowered prices on almost their entire line, and Twit listeners can save an extra 10% off the purchase of select Drobo models. It's all at drobostore.com, drobostore.com, and save by using the code TWIT10. Again, that's drobostore.com, and use the code TWIT10. And we thank Drobo for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get to my favorite part of the show when we introduce a guest who can drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And this week, we've got Dave Brita. Dave, did I say that right? Brita? Brita? You massacred it. Totally. Oh, <laughs> but it's okay. I'm used to that. That's okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to call you Dave from now on because I don't no want to redestroy your name. But you are a product. You are the director of product line management over at Ruckus. I'm pretty sure our audience doesn't need a primer on what Ruckus does. It is one of the most popular wireless companies out there, and many in the Twilight Riot are currently using Ruckus products. But uh, if you could describe what makes Ruckus different from other networking companies and other wireless companies, what would it be? We pride ourselves on our, uh, you know, the reliability and high performance connectivity. I mean, ultimately. That's what we deliver is high quality connections to today's challenging uh, applications in very dense and otherwise interference laden environments. Top quality Wi-Fi is the foundation of basically the user experience and the businesses that we serve. So I would say that's our focal area. Uh, let's talk about that focal area because right now the industry is in uh, well upgrade mode. We are we're getting faster and faster with 802.11ac. <clears throat> we went from wave one to wave two, and now we're sort of settling into the newer and newer wave two products being released, basically on a weekly basis. What is Ruckus doing as 802.11 becomes the standard? So you're right. I mean, the last uh, several years really there's been an incredibly fast refresh weight uh, in in terms of wi-fi standards you know 11n to 11 ac wave one 11 ac wave two um for us as as being or having our core focus being the reliability and high performance connectivity we've been at the cutting edge of uh, at least having a wi-fi access point portfolio that is up to date per the latest standard so you know, we've basically gone through a full portfolio refresh in 11N and then AC Wave 1 and AC Wave 2 uh, and, you know, now working on 11AX for the next uh, next year. So it's it's kept us certainly very busy uh, as far as uh, keeping a relevant and, and high performance wireless portfolio. Uh, you know, and then interestingly in the evolution of Wi-Fi, for the longest time, a gigabit Ethernet connection on the backhaul of an access point was sufficient. Uh, so if you look at 11 NAPs and the first 11 AC access points across the industry, they were all based on or at least uh, featured gigabit Ethernet backhaul ports. But with 11 AC Wave 2 at the higher ends of the uh, spectrum, or the not spectrum, but the standard, uh, you actually now have Wi-Fi capacities which are in excess of the gigabit Ethernet connection. And in that sense, you know, we're also evolving the Ethernet uh, connection on our APs to go to multi-gigabit Ethernet standards. So that's that's been a pretty new factor. Uh, that's been a wired line requirement imposed by the 11 AC Wave 2 performance. I'm glad that you brought up the fact that we've had to evolve Ethernet because for the longest time it was 
Well, okay, Ethernet does one gig, and of course your access point is going to do less than that. So one line per AP is more than enough. Of course, with AC, we've gone past that. We can now use AC, especially Wave 2 AC, to get far more aggregate than one gigabit, uh, even in each direction. So this is this is one of these these interesting things, and this is why I'm glad that you're an engineer. That's that's your background. You've you've worked on wireless technologies before you came to Ruckus. You've worked on uh, Bluetooth, on DECT. Uh, you hold an MSEE, so you, you understand what goes into the design. In designing these new technologies, especially for 802.11ac Wave 2, have you have you had to give any consideration to the RF properties of the products as you're designing them for their maximum throughput? In other words, you're not these aren't going to be deployed in a lab in a Faraday cage. They're all going to be combined together. They're all going to be screaming for attention. What are what is the most challenging RF decision you've had to make? Well, I mean, ultimately, uh, and you're you're absolutely right. There's there's a lot of uh, you know consideration that goes into the, the RF design of the access points. I mean, in fact, we invest significant R and D uh, in 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 designing our uh, radio front ends, uh, and it's not just the hardware. There's also a significant amount of uh, software development to go and actually drive that hardware. I, I would say the key to uh, the, the high performance and reliability of any access point is how well it actually handles um, troublesome inter inter excuse me troublesome uh, environments and those are environments where you have uh, many many client devices for example uh, high sources of, of interference so when we design products here you know that's really the uh, underlying goal, at least a lot of the design goals have to do with making sure that the the performance that we uh, can can achieve with the radios that we build will actually be preserved uh, across client densities and when you introduce high amounts of of interference. And again, you know that folds into both the the hardware design of the products, uh, you know, as well as the the software design. It's also impacted IT budgets as you've had to start considering, can I get a 10 gig link to my AP? Because I, I don't want to starve the AP. I want to use it to its fullest advantage, which typically means you're using category 6A, 6E. Uh, you're going a slightly different route. And I, I, I do want to talk about this. What is wrong with trying to run 6A everywhere? Well, I mean, quite frankly, it's the, it's the cost, right? I mean, many... Of our customers' sites and deployments are already cabled with Cat five or five E, uh, so the the material cost of of procuring the Category six cable and then fundamentally the actual installation costs make a, a retrofit prohibitively expensive. Uh, and it's not just the cabling, but you know we also um, obviously work with silicon vendors. You know we we. Those are the building blocks of our products or the, the chipsets that underlie everything. The silicon that drives uh, 10 gigabit FIs is also incredibly expensive. So overall, uh, 10 gig is, is, is still too expensive and, and arguably overkill for, for what uh, Wi-Fi's needs are today and for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and the interesting thing has been that, uh, you know, for the, for the longest time, uh, at least in the standard, uh, there was this big gap between one gigabit per second Ethernet and 10 gigabit per second. There was really nothing uh, in the middle as far as a standardized uh, Ethernet. And hence the, uh, the, the introduction of the multi-gigabit uh, Ethernet standard or the 802.3bz, uh, which defines 2.5 and 5 gigabit per second gigabit Ethernet uh, um, speeds, which can run on Category 5 E cable. So that eliminates the need to to upgrade the the cable, uh, and you know not just saves the cost of that cable itself, but uh, as mentioned, also saves the installation uh, expense of that. I'm glad you brought that up because I do want to talk about that eight o eight o two point b three b z. I always have a try. I always want to say eight o two eleven. It gives us two point five and five gigahertz transfer speeds over our existing copper, which reduces massively the amount of capital outlay we have to do if we're going to be updating to the latest in Wave 2 AC gear. 
how is Ruckus using it? I know it's enabled on your Zoneflex R720. Is it is it a big selling point? In other words, when your uh, when your salespeople are going out there, is is it a big enough sales point to say we don't have to upgrade your infrastructure to be able to say we will go with this over X product that requires 10 gig? Absolutely. I mean, that's a very compelling uh, um, engagement in or conversation to have in the sales process. Anything that's going to require upgrade of switching or cabling uh, as far as deploying new Wi-Fi access point is, is just an added uh, uh, expense to, to the customer and a pain point. So I think having a, a value proposition where we can go in and, and sell an access point that has uh, basically the best of what the wireless standards have to offer in terms of highest capacity 802.11 AC wave 2 wireless throughput and you don't have to touch your uh, cabling uh, infrastructure. It's it's just a very compelling uh, uh, discussion and value proposition. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that uh, that R720 because if, if my memory serves me right, that's a four-channel uh, unit, I, so I can do four channels of eight hundred two eleven AC. Yeah, four spatial streams, meaning four it's streams, actually correct. got yeah four transmit and receive uh, antennas. Uh, in fact, in total, it has eight transmitters and receivers because you have four on both two point four and five gigahertz. And now those transmitters and receivers are basically fundamental to the uh, the WIFO. Um, multiple input, multiple output, or, or MIMO, uh, you know, which is basically part of the the the, the 802.11, uh, actually 802.11n introduced MIMO, uh, but the 11ac standard really starts to take advantage of it in interesting new ways. Now, is is there demand for these products? Because I, I would think so. Sitting from where I am, if I was planning out a deployment of 802.11ac Wave 2, uh, I would be looking to save money anywhere I possibly could. And this idea of using my existing infrastructure would be very, very appealing. But have you been seeing it in the numbers? Because I know you offer multiple types of APs, including a few that do use 10 gig, correct? Standard uh, uh, Ethernet 10 gig? We actually don't have any access points that use uh, 10 gigabit oh, okay. per second Ethernet. Yeah, that's that's really just a cost prohibitive step, both on the product front and the cabling side, because as you mentioned, the CAT6 uh, requirements is expensive. Um, but certainly the, the interest and the demand in the 2.5 gig Ethernet, it's compelling. Uh, we, we and, and in 11 AC Wave 2, uh, traction on the high end of, of the performance scale is, is there. I mean, investments in uh, edge network infrastructure are usually laid out with uh, several years in mind for those, you know, that infrastructure to be in place before the next upgrade. So, you know, we have a, a good part of our customer base that's forward thinking in that sense and uh, does plan and wish to deploy the, the best of what Wi-Fi has to offer uh, at the time that they make that outlay. All right, we've got JJ to the 4884 wondering about speed comparisons between uh, BZ and AC. And we, we should remind everyone that BZ is a wired standard. So that's the connection going into your AP. The AZ, uh, AC, especially, specifically AC Wave 2, is a wireless standard. Um, so what we're, what we're talking about here right now is the fact that it does you no good to go to AC Wave 2 if you don't have enough of a backhaul uh, with with the throughput you need to actually support it, otherwise you're just you're choking it at uh, at two gigs uh, bidirectional. All right, so I I actually didn't know that Ruckus had didn't have any 10 gig products. This means that you really bet the farm on BZ. You're betting that people will want to save that money, go with the the, the cheaper infrastructure, go with the infrastructure they already have, and they'd be fine with being limited at five gigs per AP. Yeah, well, just one comment there. Uh, we don't have any 10 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet backhauled access points, but as you may know, Ruckus uh, has, you know, through our um, joining together with uh, uh, Brocade, um, we've acquired part of our portfolio now is also uh, Ethernet switching. So we certainly have 10 gigabit per second rec uh, represented in our Ethernet switch portfolio. Let's talk a little bit about adoption, because we've always run into this before, where the APs will be updated it takes a while for the clients to catch up. We're now within a generation, I'd say 18 months 
of seeing products released with native AC. These are laptops that have AC cards. Uh, we've got clients that now support AC even on things like wireless security cameras. Is, is the AC market now meeting par? Is it the new standard? Is it going to be included on every new product? Will it finally supersede the old, older standards? I would say absolutely. I mean, in terms of our product sales, we're almost exclusively selling 802.11 AC access points. Uh, you know, and even most new client devices are at least 802.11 AC compliant. The big variable is is one aspect of, of 802.11 AC, which is the multi-user MIMO feature. Uh, that's a feature that we, we see in some premium clients uh, and, uh, you know, would like to see that, you know, roll out. Uh, but that's not in obviously 100% of, of new clients these days. That's sort of the holdout feature. Right, right. Uh, with most of the other AC vendors shipping either 10 gig or multi gigabit products where you, you have two or more gig ports on the AP, including one of my favorite, uh, Xerus. I still have a couple of Xerus arrays lying around my lab. Do What sort of changes are they going to have to make to go with BZ versus multi-gigabit? Uh, because, I mean, if, if they really wanted to save on infrastructure, they'd go with the multi-gigabit, right? Because it means they don't even have to change out their switches. Well, if by multi-gigabit you mean um, aggregating multiple single-gigabit links, uh, is that is that what you mean by multi-gigabit? Right, exactly. So I, I've got an AP that will bond together two or more gigabit ports to, to g effectively give me more bandwidth. Right. Yes, I mean, there, you know, th that's uh, obviously a, a, a technically feasible and viable way of achieving in excess of a gigabit per second Ethernet connectivity to an access point, which saves uh, a person from having to upgrade their infrastructure uh, from gigabit Ethernet switch to some um, 802.3BZ compliant switch. So, uh, you know, you'll see Ruckus included most uh, Wi-Fi access point vendors uh, in the first generations of, or even on their, some of their current uh, generation of, of 11 AC access point. There are still uh, a good number of access points that do have one gigabit per second Ethernet uh, ports but they do support, uh, you know, LACP or link aggregation to to bond those. So, I mean, I would say that the value proposition of of that is basically backward compatibility with um, uh, switch uh, switching infrastructure, which is still gigabit per second. And you know, from from a Wi-Fi AP uh, sales perspective, you know, obviously. Um, uh, my uh, intent is that a, a customer shouldn't have to go and upgrade their uh, Ethernet infrastructure just to get the full benefits of the access point we're selling them. So uh, the support for, for link aggregation, you know, uh, serves that purpose as well. Let me go ahead and bring in my co-host here, Chibert. Uh, one of the issues that you have where you work is you're on a large campus and it's always difficult to do wholesale upgrades of technologies because they tend to be forklift upgrades. What do you think about BZ? Is would BZ be usable on a college campus just to go out and swap out the uh, the APs you've got right now with single gigabit, gigabit ports? Put in a BZ enabled Ruckus AP with 802.11 AC Wave Two uh, and, and get that 2.5 or 5 gigahertz bump. Actually, what Gigabyte, I'm sorry. really and truly hoping for is a copper SFP that talks BZ, because then. You know, if I have, say, an SFP plus port, dropping in a BZ um, module means I'm done. I there. Uh, I can just drop a few in so I can go and run my APs and then do a mid-span power injector. Now, that's all well and good. BZ is great. Um, universities obviously are going to love it because budgets are tight no matter what. What I'm more interested in is <clears throat> there's a lot of older buildings or a lot of um, outdoor labs, a lot of places where it's just next to impossible or cost prohibitive to get copper out to those locations. So what I'm curious about is mesh networking, you know, going sideways wirelessly so that I can go and hit a hotspot. 
seems to have been kind of the orphan in the wire- wireless networking world. Or am I wrong? Has has that started to become part of um, Wave 2? Well, I would say mesh networking definitely predates Wave 2. Um, you know, most uh, uh, serious WLAN vendors have had some form of, of mesh networking available as a feature going back probably to 11N, if not before. Uh, but there's drawbacks to it, right? When you do mesh with a Wi-Fi uh, access point, uh, you're actually using some of the spectrum that would otherwise be available for client connectivity to actually backhaul access points. So it's really a means of expanding coverage. And in many cases, you know, that trade-off is, is fully acceptable. It depends on the, the applications and the, the end throughput requirements. But, uh, you know, I, I would say that that's sort of the fundamental trade-off in, in evaluating mesh uh, versus alternate backhaul technologies is is the convenience of being able to connect access points without uh, running fixed uh, uh, wired connections. Um, you know, is is the trade off of having that wireless connection, uh, but but they're but also suffering somewhat on the overall capacity because you're now eating into user spectrum. Is that a worthwhile trade off? And again, in many cases, it is. It just depends on the actual deployment type. Uh, Chibert, uh, we've done mesh in the past where we've used one set of radios to handle the backhaul while we're distributing via another set of radios. But when we were doing it, we were, I think the highest standard was N, right? We had even gotten to AC the last time we did a mesh. Actually, that's actually a question for someone that's in the chat room right now. Oh, that's now. right. Mo yeah. Wi-Fi. Mo. Oh, I'm, that's right. She brought ruckus. Did. did we do a mesh yeah. with AC? I can't remember. I think we did to get into a few places because it was difficult to get the cable out there. Ms. Mo. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's not a panacea. There, and yes, I've seen lots and lots of people do very poorly designed mesh. You've got there's a lot of things in there. But keep in mind, I'm also one of the people that were on an original DARPA project called Sensit that spawned the standard that's now called Zigbee. But you know that's that's a completely different um, application. Um, mesh is a great technology when you absolutely positively can't get cable there. Um, and yeah, you know it's it's there. It's got lots of trade offs. And you know, I'm 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 toss this back to David. You know, obviously mesh, you're going to have to give something up. There's there's just a limited amount of resources. The things that I tell everybody when they say, oh, wireless is going to be so much faster than cable. I, no, it's not. <laughs> When you have a cable, you have 100% on that cable, and then a cable right next to it, you have the same hundred, another 100%. In RF, there's only one set of ether, so to speak, for lack of a better word, and you slice that up, and you can only just go so far. So if you start playing a mesh game, you're going to have to use part of that spectrum for backhaul. So, David, I'm going to throw this back to you and ask... So just how much of a compromise is mesh currently today? We, we had the old um, one-to-many where you'd go outward, say, on 5.8 and then do uh, 2.4. But in today's Wave 2, what are the new compromises? So I'm going to answer your question uh, the, the way I always like to start with. It depends. Um, you know, really it depends on how hardcore your mesh is, how many mesh hops you're planning to deploy. By mesh hops, what I mean is when you deploy Wi-Fi in a mesh, you have uh, ultimately you need some uh, access point, at least one of them that has the wired connection somewhere. Uh, and then, you know, every AP that's attached to it uh, uh or, or we can talk about access points in terms of how many hops they are away from that root access point. So an, an AP that is attached or meshed to the, the connected access point would be one hop away. 
an access point that needs to go through that secondary access point and then hop to the root access point would be two hops away. So the more hops you add uh, to the the mesh uh, infrastructure, uh, the more I would say the bigger the trade-off is because if you think about it, uh, if I have someone connected, a client device connected to a, a very a uh, remote access point that's many hops away from a root access point, that data, that information that gets put over the air from the client device to that access point then needs to get forwarded, you know, N number of times back to the root access point where N is your number of hops. And every one of those hops consumes uh, airtime that would otherwise be available for uh, other, other access uh, use cases. So it really depends. Now, your question as far as how does 11AC uh, Wave 2 actually evolve that picture, I mean, it helps it in so far as, uh, whereas before 11AC uh, Wave 2, you had a certain capacity per hop. 11AC Wave 2 by way of higher um, modulation rates and higher channel bandwidths and so forth allows uh, a higher um bandwidth connections just as a fundamental building block under the mesh. So um, while the trade-offs are sort of the same in a relative sense, you're starting off with um, higher capacity mesh links or building blocks. So the end result may not be as as uh, compromised if you have a very high capacity link forming your mesh, such as one formed with 11AC Wave 2. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, but you've done it again. You've used up another hour of your life listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to 9 out of 10 a to 11 AC Wave 2 devices. I do want to thank our panel, everyone who made this show possible for dropping the knowledge on the Twilight Riot. Dave, I want to start with you. Of course, you're with Ruckus Wireless. You are the director of product line management. You are one of the visionaries at that company who brings products to market could you please tell the Twyat Right where they can find you, where they can find Ruckus, where they can read up on your wireless technologies? Sure. I think the best is to direct everyone to uh, our corporate website. Please go check out uh, www.ruckuswireless.com. There's a ton of product info there. Check out what uh, we have to say about our best-in-class uh, Wi-Fi access points as well as Ethernet switches. Uh, and there's also uh, information there regarding our uh, R720, which uh, Padre spoke about earlier in the show. So that's where I'd send you. Fantastic. Uh, Dave, if you could say your name correctly once, just so <laughs> at least once in this show, it's said the right way. It's spelled B-O-T-H-A, but it sounds like? Buta. Dave Buta. With, with the, with the. <laughs> Don't worry, Padre. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for giving us knowledge. And uh, we'll welcome you back on a future episode of this week. Thank you very much. Yeah. Of course, we also need to thank my co-host and my super producer, Mr. Brian Chi, who is uh, getting over a case of the plague. Chibert, I hope you feel better next week. Could you tell the folks at home where they can find you, your work, and what you'll be up to? Well, I'm at A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B on Twitter, and I'm very, very welcoming to people that have ideas for shows. A lot of the best shows we've had recently have been ideas from people on Twitter. So please throw show ideas at me. Do introductions uh, with people you'd like to see on the show and all that kind of good stuff. Will there be some Chebert written articles in InfoWorld? Coming up soon, I sure hope so. We shall see. There's still some growing pains. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Uh, originally, I thought I was going to be able to be at Black Hat. But shall we say there are some uh, managers at the University of Hawaii that have seen fit not to let me go, even though I'm paying for it on my own money. And unfortunately, it is now too late for me to get cheap airfare. Bummer. Oh, man. But the good news is... I'm not that far away from retiring. And once I retire, I can tell the boss to go, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> I, Chibert, I think once you retire, we should just have the Chibert Village at DEF CON and we'll just fill it up with all the fun stuff that we like to play with. Yeah, I'm thinking we could do some pretty cool things. And I really want to work with Smitty on the Darknet because I've got some ideas on how we might be able to do some really, really interesting things. 
I am scared of your really interested things. So uh, we'll we'll see. Uh, Chibert, once again, thank you so very much. My friend, I wouldn't want to do the show without you. Anyway, take care, Mr. Padre. Also, thanks to you, to the people who tune in every week to watch This Week in Enterprise Tech. We wouldn't have a show without you, and we want to make it easier for you to get all the twiet goodness that you need. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our back episodes so that you can download at your leisure, as well as see the notes for the links, the stories that we've covered every week. But next to it, you also see a little set of drop-down menus. Folks, this is important. If you want to support Twiet, if you want to keep getting enterprise goodness, the best way to do it is to subscribe to get the version of your choice, audio, video, high-definition video, into your device of choice. Also, don't be afraid to share it. If there's people at your workplace who you think could benefit from the knowledge that we drop on the Twiet Riot each week, please share. Again, that's twit.tv slash twiet. Also, don't forget that you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. There, if you follow me, you get to see what I'm doing when I'm not in the Twit studios, when I'm out and about. And, and actually, probably not for two months because I'm going to be in silence for two months, which means all the tweets you see for the next two months were pre-planned. Some of them may make sense. Some of them, not so much. Also, thanks to everyone here who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and Leo, who have continued to allow us to do this week in enterprise tech to all the engineers like Alex who have set up the set so we can have a show. And also my TD who is also Alex. He's kind of doing multiple duty today. Alex, could you tell the folks at home what it is that you do here at Twit? Oh, I push Padre's buttons every Thursday morning at 11 o'clock on Know How. Yes, he does. Playing folks. the part of director. He is. He is our director. Uh, thank you, Alex. I know you don't have a camera on you right now, and I'm not going to give you the question that I give to Kevin every week because that would just be unfair and also because I think you would give me some sort of smart-ass remark because that's what you do uh, so well. We, we do appreciate it, though. So what do I get, then? Uh, how about this? What episode is this? Uh, oh, gee... Um Hold on, let me see if I can uh, if I can figure that one oh, out. Oh, come on, you have to withhold you have to uphold the honor of the substitutes. Let's see what is it? Oh, there we go. Oh, 243. Okay, there you go. All so right, cool. So uh, we continue our streak. Everyone but Kevin answers the question of the week properly. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballister, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.